In 100 years, there will be no more wars. Let me say that one more time. In 100 years, there will be no more wars. <laughs> if we look back on history, and we look at all these atrocities that have occurred throughout time, all this genocide, all these wars, we look at the Holocaust, we look at the Crusades, we look at all these things where everyone's dying, we say, what horrible things. We study in our history books, we say, these are awful, we're so much better, we've risen so much higher than, than all of these people, all of our ancestors, and then we're doing the same things over and over again. Like, we make the same exact mistakes, we still have wars, we don't see them in our daily lives. Like, we live in New York City, we don't walk down the street and say, hey, like, I might get shot today. I might just disappear from existence today. I might just disappear from the universe. But there's a lot of people in the world who, who face those challenges. And so I, I know what you're all thinking when, when I say this. This guy's kind of crazy, uh, but, but bear with me. When I was 18 years old, two years ago, I was just a high school senior. I wasn't even that good at math. I wasn't that good at computer science. I was just a kid like everyone else, not a prodigy, no one special. But I was really, really interested with this idea of war, this idea that one moment you're living, and the next moment you just disappear from existence. And it's, it's really crazy because we don't, we don't see it when we live in the US. We don't see it a lot of the places where we actually have the potential to make change. But people living in Afghanistan, people living in Iraq, Iran, all these places around the world where literally you can just be walking down the street, someone shoots you, you're done. Like, it's over. And like, that was crazy to me. Like, I had never seen that in my life. I was just some innocent high school kid who, who was just sitting on his couch watching TV. Like, like I didn't know anything about this. And, and so I said in my mind, like everyone had always, always been telling me, you can, you can do anything you want. Like you're a high school student, you're a smart kid, like you can do anything you want. Anything is anything in your imagination. And so I said it in my mind, I want to fix war. I want to, to solve war. And so it's like, how do you actually go about solving war now, <laughs> right? <laughs> So there was this open call on the internet that I found from the US State Department. And it said, hey, we have, we have a ton of data. We have all this data on political revolts. We have all this data on movements, on sentiments, on people's reactions to all these things in the world. And it's all coming online now. Our ancestors didn't have this. Our parents didn't have all this data. And every single year, this data, we're getting 10 times more data than we had in the past. And so they said, OK, People, professors, postdocs, PhD students, people with way, way more experience than me. Go take this data, go do something meaningful with it. Go try to solve war with math. And so if you look at this map, and this is anonymized, so don't look at the, at the colors literally, but um, <laughs> this is what it really means to solve war, to predict war. So you have a ton of different features that come in. You have Twitter feeds, you have news feeds, you have political data, you have social data, you have all these things that are coming online. And you want to take this, and produce some probability, hey, in this given region, this is the chance that a war is gonna occur here. In this given place and time, this is how maybe we can shift tensions away from this path that's going down a war-driven path to a path that's peace-filled. Like if you look at Ukraine, if you look at Russia, if you look at the things that are happening now in society, you don't want those to end up like another world war. So like how do we actually shift that? And how do we know first that like it is actually leading to something that we should be shifting away from? And so there was, there was all this data. I was like, I was like cool. Like, um, I'm a high school student. Like, this is really meant for like, professors, for people with way, way more experience than me. But like, I'm chill with it. Like, like, we'll get started. We'll, we'll try to do something. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I failed. And, and, I <laughs> and I was trying to read all these math papers. I was trying to read these computer science papers. And like, I had never done that before. And so I was like, I was failing. I was waking up. I was failing. I was failing again. I was failing again. And like, it, it's really frustrating when you wake up and you fail, you go to bed, and like, you've just failed five times, and like, you repeat it the next day. <laughs> but like, it's a necessary step that you have to take. And so, so I was failing, I was failing. And like, the hard thing about hard things is that like, they're, they're really hard, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so this is happening over and over again. And, and I was actually, I was so naive in my approaches. I was so naive in the ways that I was going about these problems that, that I tried something really, really stupid. Um, <laughs> and so I tried something that like, when, when you're taught, when you're classically trained in, in solving these problems, there's like a certain set of techniques that you use and like that you've, you've gone through your PhD studies and like you've learned that like, okay, this is like how I apply like this technique to this problem. And so like, I didn't know any of that because like I was just some naive high school kid. And so I was like, okay, like I'm gonna try this like random thing. And it was called sparse autoencoders with topologically normalizing spectral clustering and random forests. 
<laughs> and it's like, when I was reading that, I was like, is, is this even English? <laughs> like, like, I can barely say it now when I stand up on stage. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I did this. And like, after failing all these times and, and expecting this to fail, it, it, was, it was really weird because it, it actually worked. <laughs> and, and in fact, it, it worked so well that the US government said, like, hey, this is, this is really cool. Like, they didn't know I was a high school student. They just thought, thought I was someone who, by this time, I was at Caltech. So they were like, oh, this is some guy at Caltech just, just like building this, this cool stuff. Um, and so they're like, OK, we, we want to purchase the rights to this. And like, we'll, we'll purchase the rights, and we'll use it in, in helping us control a couple billion dollars in, in where we decide to like, push resources to prevent war. And so I was, I was sitting in like my, my Caltech freshman year class, still like completely unaware of how to read math papers. Um, <laughs> and, and the government was like using my stuff. <laughs> and it was like, it was, it was the weirdest feeling ever, but it was like, it was really cool. It was like, okay, like I failed at something 20 times. Like it was, it was super hard. Like I, I didn't think I was ever gonna get anywhere with it. And then like all of a sudden like, whoa, like, <laughs> like this is actually like something meaningful. So if you, if you look at data, if you look at, at all of the new data coming online, at all of this information that we now have that, that our parents didn't have, and all these data sets, it's, it's really a unique place in history that we're at right now. Like it's, it's really a place where we can do things potentially that no one in the past can do, and our future children, like the people in our generation and in future generations, they're going to have the potential to do even, even greater things with all this data. So it's really it's a time when, when we can solve war with math, when we can take in all this data, apply some algorithms to it that have really, really weird names that no one really understands, <laughs> and, and, uh, and do something meaningful with that. And there's this interesting story that, that I thought I should mention. Um, so right after I did this, I went to this conference, and I was, I was talking to this professor who worked on like, this similar research that I was, I was really into. I was like, this guy's like, the coolest guy. Like, he's so much smarter than me. Like, he knows everything that like, I want to know someday. Um, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, like, how, do you, how do you understand all these papers, um, like all this math? And he was like, no one understands it. Like, like, we just pretend like we understand it. Like, no one, <laughs> no, no one has a clue what's going on. <laughs> and so I think that's, <laughs> it's a really meaningful thing to hear because it's like, <laughs> it's like any of you in the audience, like if you know algebra, you could be doing things like this. Like it's actually not that far of a step if you just avoid all of the, the really, really weird language that they use. Um, <laughs> and so, so I, I think there's this, this really telling analogy about, so like I know a lot of you won't believe me when I say that like war is actually solvable with math. Like war is solvable with equations. Like people are predictable. Like we don't like to believe that, that as human beings, like, like I can tell you, okay, like you're gonna do this today and you're gonna do this later today and like tomorrow you're gonna do this. Like we don't like to believe that like our, our place in the universe is solely determined. Um, <laughs> and by all, by all means, it really isn't. Um, by all means, the stuff that, that we do on an individual basis, it's like atoms. It just shifts around randomly, and, and there's no way to predict that. But when you combine all these people into these social structures, when you combine all these people together, and you put them into these, these systems, you start to see the same exact mechanics over and over again. And it's, it's kind of weird, it's kind of scary, because you think, you think whoa, like, <laughs> we've been making the same mistakes over and over again for, for a thousand years, for millennia. And, and like, there's nothing we can ever do to fix that. Like, like you might not believe me, but it, it's really true if you look at the data that war, not peace, is our equilibrium. And like, you have to think about that for a second because like, it seems weird because it's like, oh, we live in a peaceful society. Like, it seems like society should shift to peace, but it doesn't. Like, every single peaceful society in history has ended up going downhill, has ended in war one way or another. <laughs> there's always been this force called gravity in the universe. And for the entire history of us, this force called gravity has held us down, right? So like if I try to jump up and down, like I'm always gonna land back on the ground because there's gravity. <laughs> and so years and years ago, there were these people who looked up at the moon and they said, okay, if we could counteract gravity, if we could counteract this innate force in the universe and reach the moon, what if we could do this? Imagine if, if we could build something that let us counteract this innate force. Imagine if we could get to that distant speck in the sky that's the moon. And so these people were engineers, these people were builders, and, and they built rockets, and they, they went to the moon. Everyone told them, there's no way you're gonna get to the moon. There's no way you can do this. Like, this is, this is something that we can't avoid. Like, like gravity is like, I'm jumping, like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and so if you look at war, it's, it's really no different, right? Like, there is this force in the universe that constantly pushes us towards war. If it's just entirely random that that we just, we go about our daily things and like war happens, peace happens, then like there's, there's no way we can ever fix it. 
But if we, if we see it as something like a force, like gravity, then all we have to do is, is understand its dynamics. It, it really becomes a simple problem once you understand the underlying dynamics of the system. And it really becomes something just like gravity that we can build equations around, that we can take data and output probabilities around. And so, so this is what I'm saying. If you look at the future, we're, we're really moving in a direction where, where this is going to be possible and where this is going to be something that we, we should be focusing on. Okay. So, so I, should, I should admit, at the start of this talk, I, I said something that wasn't entirely true, that I don't entirely believe. I think in 100 years, one of two things is going to happen. We will either develop a language, a mathematical language, an understanding of what causes war. We'll look back on, on the past millennia and say, like, wow, how could we ever live without, without understanding how like, our societies are built up? How could we ever live with like, actually letting us kill each other over politics? Like, like that's very abstract, but like, it, just, it seems crazy to me still, just like, saying that loud, <laughs> like, like that we actually do this. Like, it, it's so odd. Um, so that's the first thing that could happen. The second thing is if you look at all the technology that we're building out that allows us to destroy our world, chemical warfare, nuclear warfare, bio warfare, all of these things. If we don't do anything about this, I think in 100 years, we will simply cease to exist. Like, we're the young generation. Like, like, we can do something about this. Like, we're the people who are naive enough to look at this problem in a different way. We're the people who are crazy enough to say, OK, like, I don't care if past generations tell me this is, this is something we're never going to be able to do. Like, like OK, like, screw that. <laughs> like, people have been saying for, for years, you'll never reach the moon. You'll never sequence DNA, you'll never do all these things that we managed to do. Why not have us be the ones who solve war? Let's be the generation that solves war. Let's be the generation that solves war. Thank you.